there's a story that the full moon of February or March, the very first year that he was teaching, the Buddha gave a talk to a group of 1,250 arahants who had all gathered spontaneously, and then he sent them out to teach. The talk was basically to go over some of the basic principles of the teaching. Many of those arahants had gained awakening after listening to only one Dharma talk. And so they didn't realize the, some of them at least didn't realize the wide range of teachings the Buddha had. So they gave a very general survey from the very basics up to the highest. And one of the points he emphasized was what he called the heightened mind. Now the word heightened mind usually means the mind in concentration. You lift the mind above its ordinary concerns. In the description of the first jhana, the Buddha says you have directed thought and evaluation after you've put aside thoughts of sensuality and all unskillful qualities, like wrong view, wrong resolve, wrong speech, wrong action, all the wrong versions of the path. Then you direct your thoughts to the breath, then you evaluate the breath. In Thai, the term for directed thought, vita is in Thai is vito. It rhymes with the word yoke, which means to lift. So often you hear the Forrester John saying that you lift your mind to its object. All the concerns of the day, think of them as being beneath you. You're up above. And particularly sensual concerns. You know, sensuality is not so much sensual pleasures themselves, but it's the mind's fascination with thinking about them, planning them. You see this when you plan a meal. You're going to have this. Well, no, how about that? How about adding this or taking away that? And you just drop all that kind of thinking. And you're here with what's called form, your sense of the body as you feel it from within. And the most prominent aspect of form, of course, is the breath. So when you're with the breath, thinking about the breath, evaluating the breath, you've lifted the mind above ordinary everyday concerns. You've raised the level of your mind. And of course, when you're up above things, you can see them more clearly. Because when the Buddha defines the first jhana, it's not just the directed thought and evaluation. Those actually are the accompanying factors. The main factors are the sense of pleasure and rapture, or refreshment that you get when you lift the mind above its ordinary concerns, when you get the mind away from sensuality. You know, just here with the body as you feel it from within. And you breathe in a way that feels good. You're trying to develop this feeling tone, because after all, feeling is one of the metal fabrications, the things that determines the state of your mind. So you want to soothe the mind with a sense of well-being that comes from just being with the body, being with the breath as you feel it from within. And that way you're not so hungry for your other thoughts. And as far as the world outside, you're not so hungry for things to be a certain way. We live in this human world. And as the Buddha said, the entry requirements are not all that stringent. He divides karma into four types. There's what he calls bright karma and dark karma. And there's karma that's both bright and dark. And then there's karma that's neither bright nor dark. Bright karma, of course, is the good things you've done. Dark karma is when you break the precepts. Bright and dark is when you have a combination of the two. And then the karma that's neither bright nor dark, that's the karma that leads to nibbana. Now the entry requirement from the human realm is karma that's bright and dark. So we all come with a mixed bag. We all come with a mixed background. And so we're dealing with people with a mixed background. Like the story I was told one time by a 
public defender used to come here, and she was defending five kids who had been accused of rape, and she was convinced that they were innocent. But she was also convinced they were pretty dumb. They actually took an IQ test and they were down around in the 80s. And she was wondering if she could get them excused from the case on the fact that they had a, they had a low IQ. One of the other lawyers pointed out to her and said, well, 100 is basically the mid point. Half the people out there are below 100. So she gave up that idea. But it makes you stop and think. You're out on the road. Half the people out there are below 100 IQ, on average. So the world is an unsafe place. Because we can't measure anybody's karmic background, but we can assume everybody's got some good and bad in them. This is the world in which we have to live. And if we try to find satisfaction in this world, we're looking in the wrong place. This is one of the reasons why we turn within, lift the quality of our minds. On the one hand, when the mind is lifted like that, then we start creating better karma ourselves. And also the mind becomes more impervious to the impact of things outside. One of the ways the Buddha says that you gain freedom, or at least respite from your own past bad karma, is by training the mind so it's not overcome by pain, not overcome by pleasure. And when you're working with the mind in concentration, you're getting practice in how not to let the mind be overcome by pleasure. You create senses of pleasure. You try to maintain them. But if you just start wallowing in them, you destroy them. So if you want to maintain them, you have to learn how to be with them but not be overcome. And then when you can be with them like this, with a sense of alertness and mindfulness, then the mind gets better fed. Concentration is often compared to food. There's a famous analogy that practice is being like a fortress at the frontier of a, of a country where there are, there's the possibility of spies coming in from the neighboring country or soldiers. So you need mindfulness as the gatekeeper. You need soldiers inside the fortress. That's right effort. And of course, the gatekeeper and the soldiers need food, and their food is concentration. So to be fully mindful and to have the energy to delight in abandoning unskillful qualities and to delight in developing skillful ones, you need concentration. This is what lifts the mind. So as you leave the monastery, head out, think of having your mind lifted above everything around you. Not necessarily that you're better than other people, but it's in a position where it isn't attacked by things outside so much. This is a combination of concentration and discernment. There's another passage where the Buddha compares a person of discernment as to someone who goes up into a tower and looks down at the people below and sees patterns that he wouldn't see if he was down there with people. And you lift your mind to a higher level like this, and then you look at other people's behavior. You begin to see where it comes from, where it goes. Then you turn around, of course, and look at yourself. Do you have those qualities in yourself? In other words, if someone has a bad habit, you realize that this person is not the only one with that bad habit. Maybe you might have that bad habit, too. So look at yourself. But someone else has good habits. Do you have those habits too? And if you don't, well, they're human beings, you're a human being. And if you feel that your mind is not being attacked by things so much outside, you might be more willing to do the work to develop skillful habits. So when you think of heightening your mind, as I said, the main meaning has to do with getting the mind into concentration. But you can heighten it further by developing your discernment. And John Fuhrung would often say that when the mind is in concentration and is settled in for a while, you lift 
your mind above your mind. In other words, you realize it's, you can observe the, what the mind is doing at the same time that it's doing it. So it's as if you've got an inner observer watching what's going on. And it's in this way that you begin to understand your state of concentration. There was a famous pianist the past few decades from Austria who was said to be very cerebral in the way he played the piano, and he was interviewed one time about what's involved in playing the piano and his description of the psychology that goes on as you play the piano. It was really interesting. He said, you have to be alert to what you're doing. You have to be mindful to remember where you've been. And from there you have to decide where you want to take the piece. Sometimes you start playing a piece with a particular interpretation in mind, and you find that your playing is going in a different direction. And you have to decide if you want to explore that direction or bring the piece back to its original intended interpretation. Basically what you've got there is mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. And he saw that because he could observe himself while he was playing. Well, we have that same ability while we're meditating. We can observe ourselves as we meditate and begin to see how we're using form, feelings, perceptions thought fabrications, consciousness, all the aggregates in this state of concentration. And you can start analyzing it. Where is the stress? In fact, one of the ways of improving your concentration is to step back a bit like this and ask yourself, where am I causing unnecessary stress even in this pleasant state of mind? And you find that you can get the money to deeper and deeper states of concentration because you're able to observe it. This seems to be the meaning of the Buddhist statement that the mind is basically luminous. In other words, it can watch itself in action. It doesn't mean it's originally pure, just that it's able to observe itself. It says because it's luminous like that that it can develop concentration, can train itself. If you couldn't observe yourself, you'd have to depend on somebody else to observe you. That's because you have this luminous quality inside that you can see what you're doing while you're doing it, and learn how to pass more and more refined judgment on what you're doing. That's how the mind progresses, both through concentration and through discernment. You've got tranquility and insight working together here. So you're fully alert, fully mindful, fully ardent. That's how you heighten the mind. So it's more and more impervious to the things going on in the world. And has its own sense secure sense of well-being inside that it can produce and maintain. This was how we lift the mind to higher levels.